So, as you know, RNA is transcribed. I think that at this point we all know that. Then, uh, as soon as it's transcribed, almost immediately, is capped the messenger RNA, and this is the structure of the cap. As long as uh, well, the transcription progresses according to the length of the mRNA, and when it reaches the three prime end, the RNA is cleave, release, and polyadenylated. Once is all completed, all the splicing, uh, capping, polyannulation, the mRNA is transported to the cytoplasm and translated. And that's another complicated issue that you have heard and will hear about in this course. Now, there are several interactions. So, you know, poly A binds PAVP protein, and there are cap binding proteins, and so on. Um, Obviously, the real life is a bit more complicated. Uh, the RNA, as soon as it's transcribed, is covered with many proteins. Most of them, we don't know what they are doing there. And there are several steps, as I told you. And then there is a system, several systems, really, that look after the correct processing of the RNA and that the RNA will make a proper protein and not a mutated one if possible, not a misfolded one, speed of translation may have something to do with that, and so on and so forth. Then eventually it's exported, and there are systems that uh, look after the export of the RNA to the cytoplasm, obviously the translation, and then it's degraded, or at times it's stored in pea bodies or things like that. So. Uh, like in any biological molecule, you need that is stable, but you also need a bit of change. So you need a degradation mechanism. And the structure of the mRNA normally contains several signals that are there to ensure its stability, but also to ensure that eventually it's degraded and is not permanently there, that there is a turnover. And well, there are several, I am not going to enter in them. I mean, there is uh, obviously CAP, the, the, and in the five prime and three prime, uh, particularly in the three prime UTR, there are several sequences that are uh, involved in uh, destabilizing or stabilizing. As I told you, and I, we are going to talk more, when there is a mutation with a premature stop codon, the NMD is uh, looks after degrading the RNA, so uh, a protein that is faulty because it's not going to the end is going to be uh, translated. So some of these sequences, I am not going to go a lot on there, but are, for example, the ARE sequences, AU-rich elements that uh, are um, located here near the uh, polyadenylation signal. And these elements uh, are the target of several RNA binding proteins that um, interact with it and drive uh, recruit endonucleases and drive the degradation of the RNA. Now, the degradation of the RNA can occur in several ways, and we'll see in the next slide. Uh, the RNA can be the cap, the poly A can be reduced in size and several exonucleases will come from each end and degrade it. There are also sometimes that you get endonucleases and then the exonucleases working on, on the uh, ends uh, left free. Well, this is just a list. I don't think that is very useful, but uh, of all the proteins, not all, some of the proteins that bind to the AU-rich elements, so have been described sometimes that bind, Sometimes there is a nice uh, function uh, determined, other times it's not known. It's there, but not known what it does. This is an old slide, maybe this not known is already overcome. So I told you about mRNA surveillance mechanisms, and uh, the classical one is the recognition of a premature stop codon. Uh, that recognition is done 
in combination with the process of splicing. When an intron is spliced, the uh, system, the spliceosome, and all the processing system deposits 20, 25 nucleotides upstream of the exon intron junction, exon exon junction, let's say in this case, we are in the mRNA, uh, an exon junction complex is a bunch of proteins that uh, sits there all along the places where introns were before. When this mRNA is exported to the cytoplasm and starts to be translated, the ribosome will see soon have a series of elements, for example, the serf complex that is looking after translation and removing the exon junction complex. Uh, when the exo exon junction complex is, uh, let's say, upstream of splice introns, uh, then that is recognized and degraded. This is not the only uh, mechanism. There is others like uh, not stop decay. Let's say that an mRNA doesn't have stop codon. Ribosome continues up to the poly A. They are stalls and uh, there is um, a complex called Sky U1 and Sky 7 and others that will bind there and start the degradation uh, using the exosome. That is a complex of RNAs. The no-go decay, for example, if there is a structural feature that makes the ribosome to stop in the middle of the RNA and stall there, there is another system that recognizes that, cuts the RNA, and then the nuclease is 5' prime and 3' prime degraded. So the degradation it happens also normally with no defect on the mRNA. And that it happens, for example, a series of exonucleases, 3' prime exonucleases, will bite on the poly A. Eventually, when the poly A is too short, the exosome gets into function, and you have a 3 prime to 5 prime decay. At times, this is decapped, and so you have a 5 prime to 3 prime uh, decay. There are, as I told you, endonuclease uh, mediated RNA decay. You, you saw an example in the previous slide, and others that occur by interactions, for example, here, 3 prime UTR uh, activates the capping and then degradation. So it's multiple the ways that RNA can be degraded. A little bit more of detail on the non-stop decay. You have the star ribosome, Sky 7, exosome, and so on. Uh, and eventually degradation from both ends. This is the no-go, and here you have a, an example of an endonuclease mediated degradation. And finally, you have the NMD that we saw before. Now, regarding NMD, recently it has been seen that apparently it's not so precisely used only when there is a premature st uh, stop colon. Actually, obviously, if there is a faulty transcript, there is an interaction there, formation of a complex. Here, the, the signal is the premature uh, stop codon. And is removed and degraded to ev uh, avoid the uh, deleterious proteins. However, apparently, through the normal transcript, there are several exon junction complexes deposited, not only uh, in places uh, of the exon, exon junction, where the intron used to be, but somewhere else. 
And this interact with the Le case. UPF1 is the core protein of the of the exon junction complex. It's an Le case when it's phosphorylated and activates this and produce a, a fine tuning of control or modulation of the uh, mRNA levels in the cell. So it may be that this is activated in response to stress, heat, oxidative stress, things like that, and uh, you get degradation of the mRNA. Uh, as I told you before, this is just to summarize the NMD. You get the surf complex first. When you get to an a EJC, and to get to a premature stop codon with a downstream exon junction complex, because obviously this stop doesn't have any exon junction complex downstream, because there were no more introns. Normally, the three prime UTR, normally, in most cases, is not doesn't have introns. Although we'll see some examples in a while that do have introns. So. When he finds this premature uh, termination uh, codon, the surf complex makes a transition to what is the decay complex. That's it. And here, UPF1 changes, is phosphorylated, its helicase activity becomes evident, and the process of decay is initiated. There are several enzymes, including the exosome, that participate to it. The nuclease, uh, the helicase, sorry, uh, is not only UPF1. There are several other factors, like the elongation factor uh, 4A3, that acts as an helicase as well within the exon junction complex and act as a nucleation clump for all the other proteins. So we have the initiation of the decay, displacing other proteins and structures that are there, and the, the remodeling and the release of the factors. I mean, it's all the steps that I am not going to enter in the detail, if not one, that I don't know them, and two, will take a long time. Ah, here. What is interesting from the point of view of RNA splicing and of the RNA cores as well, is that mm, it has been observed that what at times is called pseudo-exons that are included in some cases during a splicing. These pseudo-exons are sequences that are within the introns that have putative splice sites that are not used. There are many of them, and all depends on the concentration of enhancers, silencers, and other proteins that are binding to the intron, they are used or not. At times, because of a mutation, we'll see an example soon, but at times also because change in the modulation of the splicing, you get introduction of an exon that is called pseudo-exon. Uh, this is the, uh, the case of the, for the example of the tropomyosin gene, then the, the joining of the pseudo-exon to the exon 3 introduces a stop codon that makes the messenger decay. And this, uh, the lab of Chris Smith has shown several years ago, there is a regulation system. It's not a mutation. The cell uses to stop and reduce the level of the tropomyosin mRNA, or at least of the mRNA, because this is a gene, I didn't explain that, that has a mutual exclusive splicing, or exon 2 or exon 3. And uh, um, at times when this one is not wanted, the pseudo-exon helps in the degradation. There are other cases 
where yes, a mutation, for example, this is a case that we described several years ago, almost two decades ago, in the middle of an intron in the ATM gene, it happened a deletion of this sequence, and this sequence caused the inclusion of this funny pseudo exon with a GC in the five prime splice side that, as you know, is not the more characteristic five prime splice side. However, it was included quite a bit, and furthermore, uh, well, obviously it had a, a stop codon, there it is, and when you you see that here is minoritary respect to the uh, mRNA expressed by the other allele. But if you mm, stop NMD by cyclohexamid, puromycin in this case, or any other way, you get equivalent expression. So this was functioning only that was degraded by NMD. Mm. But this is an accident. This caused the disease, ataxia. So uh, I, we have done a lot of work on this one, but I am not going to go in there. And um, I probably will go to the example that I have in mind, that is uh, our example where NMD has been proposed by other groups, but actually is not happening there. It's a different, still another way of regulating uh, messenger RNA. It's similar to this, but this is for NMD. I think that uh, probably Beppe Viamonti has explained something about SF, SRSF1, that is the new name of this one. In the three prime UTR, this is a splicing factor, very important splicing factor. Its, its levels are regulated by, in part, these and modulated by the cell density in a culture. I mean, if you have a low cell density, you get inclusion of the wild type isoform. If you have a high cell density, and a three prime UTR intron is activated, Hence, an exon junction complex is located downstream of the premature termination codon, and the messenger is degraded. Mm? Uh, and this, obviously, you can show that it's degraded by NMD, because if you inhibit NMD, uh, the isoform goes up. Uh, so this is a way where an splicing induction caused by cell density, for example, introduces uh, an intron in a region that w is normally never there and produces a reduction of the mRNA levels. I am going to go to our favorite protein. You may hear more from Emanuele Stock later. That is uh, the TAR DNA binding protein. It's called TDP43. That is an HNRMP, essentially. Although it's called tar binding protein, that means um, that binds to the uh, HIV uh, promoter. Uh, it's not true. This was something that was never, after the first description, was never confirmed. And actually, what we found several years later, we found the protein in, uh, in a splicing process. This protein has multiple functions in the cell. One characteristic is that aggregates, and I will tell you a little bit about that, but has a very interesting system of cell regulation of its levels, because too much is toxic, too little is toxic. So it has to be always in a very uh, constant level of, of expression. Um, the protein is a classical HRMP, have an RNA binding site, RM1, and a second one here, but that we found is not so active in the primary RNA recognition. If you mutate these two phenylalanines, the protein doesn't bind anymore its target. It's a protein that is conserved from C. elegans or fly to man, and also not only conserved in homology, but is conserved by um, functionality and target specificity. 
So recognize always sequences rich in UG and intervenes in splicing, interact with other HIMPs like A1, A2, or its equivalents in uh, fly. And uh, it does that through this region. That also is a prion-like domain that tends to catalyze aggregation of the protein. Now, we stumbled into it, and there was only one publication before us, because it's, uh, there was a polymorphism in, in the CFTR exon 9 uh, that, according to the length of this UG and the length of this U, exon 9 was uh, skipped. And we have found extreme case, or an extreme make case where U was 3 and UG was 13, that the patient has complete absence of the CFTR messenger and have a fully blown disease, but have no mutations in the gene. So it was just a splicing mutation caused by this polymorphism in the three prime splice site. And we found that the protein that was binding there was this TDP43, that mediated by other interaction with HRMPA2, A1, and so on, inhibit the three prime splice site, and the exon was skipped. But then, actually, we were studying this, and we go to this for the cell regulation. Uh, but I anticipate that that protein then, five years later that we started to study, was discovered as the protein that causes the inclusion in uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and frontotemporal dementia. And that we'll get at the end a little bit on that. But at that time, we started to study what effect has in the cell and in all the splicing process. And when we made this cell that was a stable transformant that was producing a transgenic TDP43 with the hope of putting mutants there and see what happened, we noticed that this is the normal cell. This construct can be induced by tetracycline. So when we add tetracycline to the culture media, the transgene is induced. This is the transgene that is tagged with flag. That's why it's longer. And we notice that the endogenous protein, that is this one, starts to disappear. So you can see that the cell is trying to maintain the level of TDP as it was before. So we want to look, this is the protein, as you can see here, if it is induced, the protein disappears, as in the previous slide. If we mutate the RNA binding site of the transgene, the protein is not self-regulated, and you can increase the amount of protein in the cell. And the same happens, this is the protein at the level of mRNA. These are northern blots. The real-time PCRs didn't give a, quantitative PCR didn't give a, a clear result because obviously there are several little fragments, but the question is with amplification, reduction of mRNA look like 60, 70%, while really it's 90 plus percent. The Protein is coded by two mRNAs, one shorter, that is this one, and one longer, that is this one, and have a very long 3' UTR like most uh, brain protein. Some of the brain proteins have these long 3' UTRs. Now, when we induce the protein, then the messenger RNA disappears. If the protein is mutated, then in the RNA binding site, only two amino acids, nothing happens. Uh, so we, meet, we made a, a small construct trying to map which were the regions that were critical for this self-regulation. And we reached the conclusion that just the 3' UTR 
uh, drive the self-regulation. If you put the GFP in front of the three prime UTR, uh, you get the self-regulation all the same upon induction of the transgene. Now, what you see here uh, is the protein, and uh, I'll show you later the mRNA that you can see here, but this is just to explain that, sorry. You can see that the um, removal of an NMD critical factor, UPF1, doesn't affect the regulation. Mm? You get a drop in the protein anyway, so the regulation is not done by uh, NMD. Uh, and what it does happen, you see here, this is the mRNA that comes from here, a PCR that comes from here to there. You see that the long mRNA disappears and that there is a new one that appears that actually is derived from the removal of this region in the 3' prime UTR. So a little bit like the case of the SF2 or SRSF1 that I mentioned before, and splicing within an intron. The funny thing is that this appears only when you induce TDP43. Mm? And that this messenger doesn't seem to be very productive in the amount of protein that produces. Well, uh, this shows that by several means that the, uh, better we go ahead, that the regulation is not by NMD, but it depends a lot on the presence of this sequence central to the intron. You remember here was the, that 700 bases of the intron. And that is a region that binds TDP43 itself. There are several binding sites of TDP43. If you remove it, then there is no longer self-regulation. So the excess of TDP43 comes and binds here and induces the splicing of this region. The curious thing is that this poly-A is within the intron as well. So if this intron is removed, the poly A1, that is the main one, the ones that give the uh, more abundant form, is eliminated. And as you can see, the second one seems not to produce enough uh, protein. No? Um, wait. So this one, you always get the right amount of protein when you have the poly A1. The poly A2, well, we'll see it better later. Uh, you can see here, but it's not correct to compare. Uh, it's much lower amount of mRNA. So we thought maybe this poly A2 is of bad quality and so on. We'll see something more about that later. If you force the splicing of this region by getting these splice sites much better, then there is no longer self-regulation. But also there is a much lower amount of protein produced, as if it was a self-regulation continuously. Hmm? And that happens at the level of the protein, and happens at the level of the messenger. Here is a co-transfection between the construct that has the normal splice size and the construct that have the splice size mutated. And um, you can see that there is quite a difference. Uh, if you do the cDNA, so this as a cDNA, you get a lot of messengers. So Apparently, it's not that this poly A2 doesn't work for translation, for example, or for export or whatever. You get 
as much as you uh, do it as a cDNA. So if a splicing is not involved, okay? So why is that? Uh, there are other differences. Here uh, you have uh, an mRNA detection in the cells. And you can see that um, the mRNA is in the cytoplasm, as should be in the case of the wild type. Also, it's there in the case of the cDNA. But in the case of a forced efficient splicing of that intron, the mRNA is distributed all over the cell. Mm. So it's in the nucleus, the cytoplasm, and has a different distribution. So at that point, we go to this conclusion, more or less. This messenger and these messengers are identical. But this produces very little protein if it is synthesized via splicing. This one produces a lot if it is only synthesized by transcription with no splicing involved. So there was a difference that was the splicing. So we thought, well, there is an unproductive splicing complex that has got stuck. The nucleus recognizes it and degrades it. So you get less messenger. Why that unproductive splicing complex will be stuck? So we thought that maybe this three prime splice site was too close to the polyannulation site. That is a possibility. If you look at the databases, this distance between the last three prime splice site and the first poly A is normally over 120, 130. This is just on the borderline. So we put a spacer here coming from the globin gene. And we get still regulation if we keep this distance. If we put a longer spacer with the poly A2 further away, then there is no more regulation. And there is splicing of a lot of messenger without this alternative splicing here. So and you have here the protein. Here is self-regulate. Here it doesn't. So that distance was critical. So probably, and that we don't know yet, the assembly of the spliceosome in this position prevents or disturbs the assembly of the polyannulation. And that dispute leaves the messenger without the pre mRNA without processing, and uh, it is degraded. Uh, if instead of poly A2, you use the globin poly A to see more efficient poly A and so on, uh, you get the same. There is no difference. So the important thing is the distance. And again, at the level of the messenger, you can see that it's the same thing. You get uh, larger differences uh, if the distance is short and if the distance is long. So the idea is this one. There is a disruption. They disturb each other, the poly A complex and the spliceosomal complex, if this spliceosomal is activated. So the splicing gets stuck. Some goes on and goes outside, but some, most of it is completely degraded. What it gets outside makes a bit of protein. Instead, if the distance is longer, the two complexes function nicely. No, they don't disturb each other. There is a good splicing, very efficient, and you get a lot of protein. Hmm? So this configuration is what is responsible, together with the binding of TDP in this region, of the self-regulation. And it's not, as I said, because 
the stop colonies here is not because of the uh, NMD. Now, just to finish quickly on a note, w why does this may be important apart from being boring? Because obviously I understand that for someone that is not in this, first time that you hear is terrible. Second time as well. Uh, but um, I told you before that this protein is involved in the is the protein that forms the inclusions in the brain of people with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, this is a very serious disease. Uh, prognosis is death within two to five years after diagnosis. You probably hear a, a bit more about the disease and neurodegeneration in general in Emanuele's uh, talk. So I'm not going to go in more detail of the disease. The only thing is that the characteristic of the disease, like in others neurodegenerative disease like Huntington or Parkinson or, or Alzheimer, you see inclusions or in the cell body, or in the cytoplasm on the cell body, or in the nucleus. In ALS, the interesting thing was, for example, in this neuron, not all of them are like that, you see a very big brownish stain in for TDP43. You see this big clump of TDP43 in the cytoplasm, and you see that the nucleus of the neuron doesn't stain for the protein. So, it's possible that the accumulation in the cytoplasm is such that the nucleus doesn't make enough. The protein is a nuclear one, although shuttles from nucleus to cytoplasm and probably travels along the dendrites and axon together with messenger RNA. So one possibility was that this actually was in a, a kind of knockout of TDP43 in the brain of these people. So there were two hypotheses, they are still today. The aggregates, those clumps that you see are toxic and kill the neuron, or the absence of TDP from the nucleus is what causes the problem. So as I told you, the fly has the same protein. Uh, so um, in collaboration with Fabian Fagin, uh, obviously Emanuele Burati was involved as well, we did a knockout of the TBPH, that is the ortholog in Drosophila, and this, you see there is no more protein there, but the Drosophila develops. This is the mutant, this is the normal one. They de develop the same, normal eye, normal legs, limbs, etc. but this one is paralytic. Doesn't come out of the pupa. Can develop on larva, but not after the pupa. Dies at day, or day one, day two, probably because of starvation. So TDP, it was important, or TBPH in this case, for locomotion. And that was because, if you look at the larva already, this is the normal neuromuscular junction. This is the neuromuscular junction of a fly that does not have TD TBPH or TDP43. So it's atrophic, deformed, and so on. If you express in neurons in this fly human TDP43, you recover a good look of the neuromuscular junction and the fly recovers motility. So it seems that this protein has something to do with the maintenance of the and development of the neuromuscular junction. What is very interesting is that actually doesn't uh, the neurons seem not seem not to be dead, just that they cannot function. You can recover them. I don't have time to tell you all the story, but there are regions of TDP, and I mentioned one to you, that region in the, three, in the C terminus of the protein, that 
are prion-like and the protein has a tendency to aggregate. If you use the amino terminus and a repeat of that, very abundant 12 times that sequence, you get aggregates that in tissue culture cell uh, causes uh, aggregation and loss of function. So it causes a knockout. Uh, let me see if I can show you. No, I don't have it here. I mean, this picture, this is a gene called polydip 3 that have two RNA forms normally. When TDP is not there, has only one. And this picture, you see it with the aggregation, or you see it also uh, with the psi. So it's the same. If you knock it down by a psi or you knock it down by aggregation, you get a dysfunction on splicing. This gene has nothing to do with just a marker. It has nothing to do with the neuromuscular junction. And you can see here, or maybe you can see it, these cells, the aggregates have been induced by this molecule, and the nucleus are empty of TDP43 staining. Hmm? And all the TDP43 is in aggregates in the cytoplasm, or most of it. Hmm? These are, the yellow dots are colocalization of uh, TDP43 and this molecule that has a GFP marker or flag marker. So if I introduce that protein that produces aggregate, induce aggregation in the fly, uh, and we go there in a minute, this is just a summary of what I told you. SITDP gives this, gives the change in functionality. Full aggregation of TDP gives the change of functionality comparable to this one. I can produce aggregates where the uh, protein in the nucleus remain more or less there. There are aggregates in the cytoplasm. You don't see the yellow dots, but there is a lot of protein in the nucleus. In that case, I don't lose functionality. Now, how we measure functionality apart from splicing, uh, we can measure, it, for example, for the climbing of the flies. This is a climbing assay. The flies on the three tubes on the right are controls. In the left are flies with aggregates. So you see, these ones climb very fast. And this one practically all in the bottom. Mm. So this one, uh, we measure uh, locomotion. This is one easy way to measure it. A lot of them, you can do statistics and so on. And what we have found, well, obviously, the SI S S fly doesn't move. The one with the aggregates that were moderate, that leave some TDP in there, present a phenotype about 14 days after adult life. They start to climb less than the wild type. This is a climbing assay. They die earlier. This is a lifespan. The ones that produce aggregates that clear the nucleus of TDP, at day three already have a loss of climbing ability and the lifespan is much shorter. Uh, why? Wait, because this is an important point for us at least. Why this one that has a lot there, in the cell at least, start to lose at day 14 the ability to move? We went and looked, there was a um, a report that in mouse, TDP43 levels fall with age. So we went to look in the flies, and actually what happened is that actually in the adult life, already at day two, you have a drop, and at day five, a, a larger drop, and a very little amount of TBPH or TDP43 at day 10. 
and this is the climbing. And you can see that the day where phenotype starts to be significant coincides with the lower TBPH. So the aggregates are not very efficient in trapping, but in the long run, when TDP is not, the nucleus is not making so much because there is a physiological program of aging and dropping of the protein, you get the effect. Actually, in the aggregates that are more efficient in capturing, you get the effect much earlier at day three. And this is the mouse to show you that also in the mouse, the same drop happens. So is conserved from flight to mouse. The physiological program of dropping TDP43. We are trying to find out if it is also conserving humans. Well, these are just things around. I am very late. What can we do after we know all this? So the idea is that you get aggregation and the nucleus is making very little and the aggregates grow, capturing all what is made in the nucleus. Mm? Because he, here is a decay, well type decay, but it's enough. But obviously there are aggregates that are capturing, it's not enough. So what can, can we do to try to do something for the patients? So one possibility would be to try things that can release the aggregates, remove them. If you remove that, you may revert to this situation. So as it's easier to work with flies than with uh, humans, we tried several drugs that were known to uh, stimulate autophagocytosis or proteasome. And these are drugs already in the market that are tricyclic antidepressive drugs. And actually, you can see here in vitro, in the cells, you get a recovery. This, you don't see it very well here, but this is a situation where there is a lot of a skipping in this exon, much more than here in the control. If you add the drug, you get a reversion to something similar to this. There are much better pictures than this one, but you can see here again with this drug or here with this drug. I mean, this picture is not exactly this one, but is much better than this one. So we try it in flies and actually we get a small recovery of the locomotion ability of the flies if you treat it with this drug. So to finish, because I am over time, what has to do one thing with the other? So the regulation of TDP43, you know, the neuron produces TDP43, mRNA, protein goes, uh, is translated, then goes back to the nucleus, shuttled between nucleus and cytoplasm, maybe goes somewhere here taking messenger RNAs that are important for the cell. When there are aggregation, the nucleus start to not being able to compensate for the lack of protein in the nucleus until the aggregates are so big that capture everything. And so the neuromuscular junction get degenerated. This make, is made worse by the cell regulation process. Because as the nucleus sees that there is no TDP coming back, makes more messenger for the process that we have seen before, and makes more protein, and the aggregates grow and are more efficient in capturing TDP43. Well, I withdraw the anesthesia. You can wake up. Thank you. <laughs>